So ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to our many talks. Those who don't know me, my name is I'm Charles Gatebe. Uh, today, of course, you know, we have a, an honored guest all the way from uh, the University of Georgia, who was also part of us for about 10 years. Uh, but today he's here to talk about a very interesting topic. Uh, if you are familiar with the many talks, we don't introduce people. They actually introduce themselves. So what I'm going to do is just tell you a very short story just to capture this moment. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll proceed. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, in his book, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, uh, Nelson Mandela, who is well-known uh, civil rights activist, and he was also the, the first black president of South Africa. He compares a leader to a shepherd. Okay, very important. He says that a shepherd stays behind the flock, letting the most nibble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they are being directed from behind. But when there is danger, when there is danger, a shepherd takes the front line. When there is danger, a shepherd takes the front line. And that's a good leader. So today, as I said, we are very honored uh, to have one of very rare kind of scientists, very good in science, and for him appearing on national television is trivial. So if you want lessons on how to appear on national TVs, then Marshall Shepard is here. And uh, he is going to provide a very compelling look at how we communicate or miscommunicate, miscommunicate weather and climate. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to waste more time than that. So, please help me welcome our speaker, Marshal Shepard. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, it's uh, really nice to be back. I consider this home turf. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I spent about 12 years of my career here at Goddard over in building 22 and then building 33 after that. A lot of good friends and colleagues here, so it's good to be back. I feel like I'm going to explode because they mic me up with two mics here, so I'm not wearing any bombs or anything if you're seeing all these wires. But um, one of the most interesting things, I'm actually in town for the uh, Precipitation Measurement Mission Science Team meeting, PMM, up in uh, Baltimore, so I was able to coordinate coming down. So thank you for all, all for coming. Uh, I promise by the end of the talk, the title of this talk will make some sense to you. Because that's certainly one of the things that uh, when I use this title for a talk, uh, people always ask, what in the world are you talking about? But I also understand with these maniac talks, uh, you want to know a little bit more about me and my trajectory. So I'm, I promise I'm going to fold all of that in, and everything in that title will actually be touched on and more today. So just go with me. <laughs> so let's just start off with this. Um, if you've been watching the news lately, even this week, the big media story is that in 15 years, we're going to enter another ice age. And so this is certainly one of my favorite movies, my kids' favorite movies. Uh, I assure you that we probably aren't going to enter another ice age to the point that this little guy is going to have to hoard up his acorns. Uh, certainly this story that I'm referring to illustrates the very need for the type of talk that I will ultimately give today because it's a, a gross misrepresentation of the peer-reviewed literature and, and how we tend to see the media uh, conflate and inflate stories. So that's one of the sort of impetus for the talk today, but I am going different, many different places. I'll introduce myself. Um, these are some of the sort of titles I've been given along the way. Uh, I don't really care about those, but if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, I am a big tweeter, uh, at Dr. Shepherd 2013 um, Those are my two kids. They are the foundation by which I think about much of the work that I do in science, because the planet that we live on now will be their planet. And as I often tell people uh, when I talk about climate and climate change, and a climate uh, skeptic uh, comes up to me and says, you're wrong about this topic, I said, I hope you're right for their sake. And so this is really the context by which I will do the talk today. So I'm going to talk about me in a moment, but let me just provide some overarching context for this talk. So this is a recent study published in USA Today. Um, the differences of opinion between the public 
and AAAS members, science, on various topics of the day. And if you look up here, climate change, uh, climate change is mostly due to human activity. Well, 87% of scientists, yeah, duh. Um, but the public, only 50%. And pick your favorite topic of the moment, whether it's vaccines or whatever, and you see a, a large disconnect between the public and scientists who study these things. Now, that's, that's upsetting. But that's really the era that we're in. And so how we communicate science, particularly weather and climate, is of utmost importance. And it's particularly challenging given now, if it wasn't for blogs, podcasts, and Twitter, I'd never know what's going on. I think that's really what informs a great number of people these days in science. Well, that's yikes part one. Yikes part two. This is a tornado barreling across an interstate a couple of months ago in uh, northern Illinois. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of people will, in this situation, drive their cars under an, over, an under overpass on an interstate because they think that's the right thing to do because they don't want their car damaged by hail. But that's actually one of the worst things to do. So from a standpoint of weather communication, this is another example of how there are disconnects in terms of what people think about weather and climate and what we should do. So let's just kind of remind ourselves of what the force of one of these powers of nature here. That's a house. The house is coming apart. Thank you. I just told him it was a house. Yes. <laughs> See that? So the, the, the power of these storms and the destructivity of them. The whole house came apart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, um, Whenever I show this, I appreciate the secondary narration, but the, the greater point is, with weather and climate, we're dealing with a force and we're dealing with a topic that touches people's lives every day. And so people feel akin to the subject, they feel that they have an understanding of weather and climate. And so it makes our job easy, but it also makes it challenging because as a scientist or an in, as an engineer, um, you've got this. No, some guy on Twitter said you're wrong, dude. So this is what we deal with. And so the whole notion of communicating in an effective manner is one of the most important things that I have taken up in my career. I have tenure. I've got all the sort of scientific credibility and all of that stuff that you need. So I don't mind embarking into the world public forum now to try to improve our understanding of this. And it's not just the public. You've got senators holding up ice balls in on the floor of Congress as an example of why climate change is supposedly not real. So this is a nice thing about being an academic now, because I can show this and not worry about it at all. If I worked at Goddard, I wouldn't show this at all. <laughs> but, but as an academic now, I can get away with that kind of stuff. Right? You know, but this is actually me in the Senate a couple years ago. I apologize for the picture. But I'm actually, this is a briefing, not a hearing. This, if this were a hearing, the senators would be up here. But we're briefing them, so they're sitting here. And it was actually a briefing on climate change. So why am I here? Let's just kind of cut to the chase. I believe that too many scientists are comfortable in the ivory tower, publishing in journals and going to conferences. But when we're not in the public sphere, a gale of misinformation rushes in to replace the void if the scientists are not there communicating to the public, stakeholders, and students. So that's really something, this was quoted uh, in a, an article I was interviewed uh, in recently. And this really sets the stage for why I give these types of talks, why I'm now doing the show Weather Geek, shameless plug, every Sunday at noon on the Weather Channel. Although if you have Verizon Fios, you're not going to see it. Because Verizon Fios' Weather Channel doesn't. So certainly I can't say much about that. But uh, we do have the old shows on the, on the uh, web if you want to see those. This is a recent show with Dr. Jeff Halverson and Dr. Scott Braun where we were talking about the value of trim and GPM recently. But before I get there, let's talk about the <laughs> I heard you, Dave Raphael. <laughs> let's talk about communicating weather and climate, because it has followed me through all of my acronyms. What do I mean by that? Well, from North Canton Elementary School, through Cherokee High School, through Florida State University, through NASA, through the University of Georgia, through the Weather Channel and beyond. It's always been there. Because that little guy there that's about to graduate from kindergarten was always interested in science. And I thought at that time I wanted to be an entomologist. For those of you who know what entomology is, study of insects. Well, I got stung by a bee catching one out in the yard 
found out I was highly allergic to bee stings and almost died. And so, okay, I said plan B on career, because uh, I don't need to get stung by things and die. So uh, that's when I discovered meteorology. But I did a science project called Can a Sixth Grader Predict the Weather? And I, you know, my, my parents, my, I, was, I grew up in a single parent home. Both my parents were teachers, but I grew up with my mom. You know, she was a teacher. She did okay, but we didn't have a lot of money around the house. So, you know, there were these fancy weather stations around, but I said, okay, I'm going to make my own. So I made all the weather instruments from things around the house and developed a little weather model for my community in North Georgia, a place called Canton, Georgia. And, you know, that little sixth grade science project ended up going all the way to the state science fair in Georgia. Who knew that making an anemometer out of ping pong balls would actually end up being quite interesting? But it sparked an interest. But the interesting thing about that is I didn't stay with weather. This is Shepard wins again. I didn't write the headline. <laughs> but this is a project in eighth grade. The Afros were in then. But this is a project in eighth grade. Do blacks have higher blood pressure than whites? If so, why? This is an eighth grade project, and I sampled 100 African Americans, 100 uh, white Americans, looked at various. Now, these sound like very simple little science projects, but they were following the scientific method. They were you were asking questions, uh, formulating hypotheses, and developing data and methodology to sort of refute or prove your hypothesis. That's the scientific method. That's what we do here. That's what GPM does. We ask big science questions and then just spend a billion dollars. We don't use ping pong balls, but whatever it costs, to answer those questions, and that's important. So my point here being, even though I was interested, I knew that guy right there in eighth grade knew he wanted to be a meteorologist. But I was doing science projects on all kinds of stuff because I was just interested in all kinds of things. But at that point, I already had in my head that I was going to go to Florida State University and major in meteorology because I was from the South. It was one of the few schools in the South at that time that had a really good meteorology program. But there were some things along the way from before I got to NASA. This is me with a couple of my fraternity brothers. And I trust some, at some point yellow pants were in. That's me <laughs> at some point. So this is me with a couple of my um, guys that I pledged my fraternity with on the beach, Panama City Beach. Um, this is my time at Florida State University. And I, I show you this because you know, I was always good in science, but I was a pretty normal guy. I pledged fraternity. I did the things that normal college students did. Uh, and then from that point on, went on and got my master's degree. Only a minute, I'll tell the story of that in a moment. And I ended up here at NASA Goddard. This was probably a few months after I was actually on the, on the center here. Uh, there's a trim uh, satellite module there. This is a mock-up. This wasn't the real satellite. I can't, what's the, I can't even remember the building number over here. Is it building? Uh, I can't even remember which building it is. It's one of the big buildings over there. It has the big thermal vac chambers. Seven, seven. So there's a sp there was a space shuttle mock up in there at the time, and so I'm at this point a kid in a candy store. I mean I'm at NASA, and but then Franco and Audi, who's here in the audience, <laughs> sitting right there, you know, the, you know, you know, we kind of had a sort of a gentleman's agreement that I was going to go back and do a PhD <laughs> at some point because uh, I was here working as a master's degree. Uh, scientist, sort of a supporting role within the Severe Storms branch at that time, I think it was. But I did ultimately go back to Florida State, get my PhD, and come back as a, a, a research scientist here, meter, research meteorologist. And along the way, that's where I picked up some of my research. For, for example, this is actually the work I was doing where I was going to show you examples of thunderstorms being generated by the city of Atlanta. And this was actually a a look at GPM satellite being developed uh, over time. But that was the other thing that kept me busy during my time here at Goddard. I was the deputy project scientist for the GPM mission for several years before I moved on to the University of Georgia. So that was kind of the next step along the way. 
that was kind of the next step along the way. I became a professor at the University of Georgia. So these days, when people find out that I'm a professor at the University of Georgia, I immediately get one question. What do you teach? And that's a very normal question. If any of you have ever been in academia, you know that. But believe it or not, and I thought this was an opportunity, professors actually do a lot more than teach. In fact, we don't teach quite as we don't teach as much as you think we do at a university, particularly at a research one university. Um, we have various appointments. So I basically teach one or two classes a, a semester. I'm the director of the atmospheric sciences program there. So I, I do teach every now and then, but we're certainly there for our research programs and for mentoring graduate students, uh, serving on international panels and whatnot. So it's interesting because one of the things in this talk I wanted to kind of convey is that um, when we're in school, we see our professors as teachers because that's how we relate to them. But um, as I tell young students that come into the university, their professor is likely a person that wrote the book they're using or is likely a top expert in whatever that particular field is. So we, we're trying to give them a broader view of what a professor is. Now, speaking of that, I'm also a meteorologist. Now, meteorologists, most of them, I'm, I was the past president of the American Meteorological Society, 14,000 members. Only 8% of the AMS membership are TV meteorologists, although that's what most people think when you tell someone you're a meteorologist. Uh, most work for the National Weather Service, NASA, businesses, et cetera. Most are not climatologists, and most actually got interested in meteorology in sixth grade or middle school, as I did. We have statistics on that. And no, as a meteorologist, I don't know what the weather is going to be tomorrow necessarily. I don't know if your daughter's wedding is going to get rained on in six months. I am not on a local channel. And I don't believe in global war warming any more than I believe in gravity or the sun's going to rise tomorrow. It's science, not the tooth fairy. My kid believes in the tooth fairy. But these are the four questions I often get when I tell someone that I'm a meteorologist. Those, those are in, one of those questions is inevitable, is inevitable. So it's much broader field than that. And so then uh, during that time after University of Georgia, I did, I was fortunate enough to be recognized by my peers and voted the president of the American Meteorological Society. I, this is me re being conferred and giving my, I guess, accepted speech, if you will. So it's been an interesting ride. You know, you know I still say that NASA is our, my dream job. I mean. The reality is if you're working here at NASA, and particularly if you're a civil servant, there aren't too many people ever on the planet that can say they had a NASA badge, right? That's a very unique career. So I always cherish that as a career. But it was a really, uh, and I appreciate all the time and effort and people that supported my career, but it really opened up some doors that, uh, and allowed me to do some other things. So uh, 10 years later, now I can't believe it's been 10 years since I left Goddard. <coughs> Things have been going well, so I've been, done, done some really cool things. I mean, who gets to take a selfie with Charles Bolden, Bill Nye the science guy? Um, this is the congressman, and I can't think of his name right now, he's a physicist from Illinois, uh, the only, I think, scientist in Congress right now and his staffer. This is at the White House a couple of months ago. We were there for the White House Science Fair. Um, that's me coming out of the White House. Who gets to receive an award and share a stage with Dr. Jane Goodall I'm still not worthy of that. I'm still sort of pinching myself that that happened. But we were both recognized by Ted Turner and his foundation recently. Uh, and it was just an awesome experience. Um, who gets the moonlight with a TV show on the Weather Channel and turn on and have your kids come up to you and say, Daddy, you're in my direct TV guide. I didn't even know that it was like that until Anderson was flipping through when we first started the show. Because I didn't know, I didn't, honestly just didn't know that was there. But point is, all of that's cool. I mean, it's neat, but that's, that's not what it's about for me. It's about the fact that all of those things give me a platform to communicate weather and climate, which I love. So where am I going now with those? You still haven't told me, Shepard, about co zombies, cola, and sports. All right, so I told you a little bit about what I'm up to and who I am, and we can take questions if you want to know more. But what are my goals today in this remaining 20 minutes or so? I want to talk about the challenges of communicating weather and climate, overcoming those challenges, and I'll offer a few tips for communicating science broadly. So the challenges, weather versus climate, perceptions and beliefs, 
and what I call zombie theories, which I'll define here in a moment. Well, let's deal with challenge number one, weather versus climate. Well, we all know that Boston broke all kinds of snow records this year, and I had various people tweeting me and saying, hey, Dr. Shepard, I've got 40 inches of global warming in my yard. So I get <laughs> tweets like that all the time. These are sort of the thoughts and, and experiences. And generally on a cold day, I mean, a lot of people will come up to you and say, what are you guys talking about climate warming? It's 30, to 30 degrees today, and it's been that way for the last several years. Well, that basically illustrates a fundamental sort of climate and science literacy issue that propagates through our society in that most people honestly don't understand the difference between weather and climate. And so I came up with a way to try to convey this. This is that weather is your mood and climate is your personality. Because I can be in a bad mood today and that might not necessarily tell me anything about my personality or vice versa. And so whether any manifestation of weather over a given day, week, or even a month or season doesn't refute or approve, or approve anything about climate warming. Yet people will look at their local experience and draw a conclusion. So one of the, one of the key sort of takeaways from any talk I give like this is we have to understand and make sure that people understand the difference with weather versus climate. Well, if you like sports, I, I can use this. He's weather. He's climate. Because he's going to enact a given play on the court in any given moment, although he probably has all kind of plays and background ideas and things that he thinks should happen, but what actually happens is going to happen because he does it, right? So it's another way to think about what weather and climate is. And by the way, if you follow this at all, it's not even clear that weather, weather and climate are related. But in this case, it's not clear that they are getting along too well. So, uh, <laughs> give you a couple examples of weather versus climate uh, there in those last. So then challenge number two, perceptions and beliefs. I already mentioned that I get this question often, do you believe in climate change? I get that question a lot. I'm sure many of my climate colleagues, I see many of you in the room get that question as well. I also get this one a lot as a meteorologist. Hey, Dr. Shepard, it must be nice to work in a field where you guys can be wrong 50% of the time and still get paid. That's, an, that's another one that meteorologists hear quite a bit. But in both of these questions, it actually, I try to smile because I'm a nice, I, mean, I'm a, I, I really am a nice guy. But when I get these questions, the thing that I'm thinking is the person that's asking me that question, it's illustrating their science, lack of science literacy, not mine. Because someone that says this doesn't understand it. Weather forecasts are right almost all the time, about 90 plus percent of the time. But what we find is that people, believe it or not, and I'm about, I'm about to put some of, you, some of you on the spot, <laughs> people don't understand what 40% chance of rain means. How many of you think you understand what it means? Anybody want to offer a, a, someone, someone that thinks they know, tell me. And this is a highly educated audience, so you're probably going to get it right. But the general public, yes. In the area, 40% of the area is likely to get rain that day? You're wrong. You're, you're kind of right. You're kind of right. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calibrate it some. Anybody want to add to it? Um, like out of a certain number of days, mm -hmm. like if they all had the same conditions, like 40%, it would rain. That's kind of an answer I often get to, but it's wrong also. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Um, what else? Yes, Bob Rosenberg. My former Sunday, one of the things that... Yeah, one of the things I did at Goddard is I played in the softball league, and Bob Rosenberg was our longtime Sundogs manager. So thank you for allowing me to play on the team. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Dave, Dave Mako invited me out to the game last night, but I was up at the science team meeting. I, yeah, trust me, I still can't hit like I used to. <laughs> Go ahead. Does it mean that any given individual 
um, has a 40% chance of experiencing rain? Uh, no. <laughs> but yeah, anybody? Yeah, you're, the first answer was the closest, but yes. Four out of 10 times that forecast is made, it will rain. Uh, so not, not really. We'll take one more, yes. Is the weight average of uh, the likelihood of precipitation within uh, the forecast area? Yeah, that's, that's really the closest one. But, did you, but do we see what just happened here? And a group of really smart people, you had no idea what the 40% chance of rain meant. <laughs> Bottom line, right? But it's really this notion of a percent aerial coverage with some confidence on top of that. So if I think 100% of the area, I mean, if I'm 100% certain that 40% of the area will receive rain, that would be a 40% chance of rain. But if I'm 50% certain that that area, it would have been a 20% chance of rain. So there's an area and a confidence with that estimate that the meteorologist uses. And if you want more details on that, just Google 40% chance of rain in National Weather Service. It's a good website. But the, where I'm going with that, I was tubing with my son the other day in the Chattahoochee River in Georgia. Lost my cell phone, by the way. It's now at the bottom of the Chattahoochee River. Um, but it started raining. And the reason I lost my cell phone, it was raining really hard. It was lightning, too. By the way, don't go near trees when it's lightning. That's another thing that I've been on lately. But, I jumped out of the, my tube to, to help my son because he was scared. It was raining. It was rain. He, he fell out of his tube. It wasn't really that deep. So I just dove out to save him father instinct. And I lost my phone. But I heard a woman, as we drifted downstream a little bit more and it started, it was sunny again, said, those dang meteorologists, there was only a 20% chance of rain today and it rained. See, they don't know what they're talking about. But that forecast wasn't for 0% chance of rain. It was for 20% chance of rain. So that forecast wasn't wrong. So I spent all, spent all that to say that there are perceptions of what we think is right versus what is right. And so because people's perceptions of what they think, it causes them to think a lot of forecasts are wrong when they're actually right. Here's another example. Did you guys hear about the major snowstorm in Atlanta a couple of years ago? An uh, inch and a half of snow. And it looked like the apocalypse. I mean, there were cars everywhere. Now, you, know, you want to know at the end of the day what this was about, why this happened? I mean, Atlanta has gotten six inches of snow before, three inches. It's not, but what this was about was a perception issue. Because on that particular event, the Weather Service, National Weather Service, had issued a winter storm watch. And then they issued a winter weather advisory. And everyone in Georgia thought that was a downgrade when actually an advisory in this case was a step up. And so it illustrated something that social scientists have now studied for this case. We need to do a better job explaining to people what watches, advisories, and warnings are. Because people think they know, but they don't. And so that little semantic difference there caused a five-day nightmare in a city with six million people. One more example of perception. You guys have seen this, right? We're in hurricane season now. This is how the National Hurricane Center issues a landfall forecast. This is called the cone. We call it the cone of uncertainty. Now, a couple of points here. Eric Blake, a colleague of mine at the National Hurricane Center. This is the cone of uncertainty for super, Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. This is what it would be today with our technology. So the point there is, our skill has improved. There would be less uncertainty around the forecast. So that's one of the first points I want to make because people say we're not making any progress with weather forecasts. We are. But the real point I want to make, because anchoring onto this perception issue, most of the public, not you, but most of the public thinks if that hurricane doesn't go down the center of that cone, if it goes here, the forecast is wrong. But it's not. That is the cone of probable uh, outcomes from the models. We don't, there's a reason we don't just put a line and say the hurricane's going there. Our science isn't there. We have to give a cone with uncertainty because of the ensembling, the way we take the various models. Yet, if this storm goes here, there will be congressmen and public and everyone else saying, that's a travesty, that forecast is wrong, I need to have hearings. 
When in fact, the meteorologists will look at that and like, what's the problem? That was a good forecast. It was within our cone of uncertainty. But, and that's only because we don't have the ability to give an exact line forecast. So what are some other weather myths out there that maybe some of us are guilty of? I get this one all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, that's heat lightning. Uh, it's all that, that lightning you see in the sky. You guys hear that up here? It may be just a southern thing. So the, the notion that you see the lightning and you don't hear the thunder, that's all heat. All it is is the lightning's too far away to hear the thunder. But many people think it's just lightning being caused because it's hot that day. <laughs> so it's, but, um, you know, their grandma, their uncle has told them that, and it just, it just passes on. A lot of people don't think it gets cold in deserts when it actually can get really cold in deserts at night. This is a perception thing, and this, this is also similar to this notion that people have about climate warming. If it's cold on a given day, that we can't have climate change. It's just sort of people associations with their base of knowledge. Most people don't realize, believe it, I'm, I'm giving you stats. These aren't just, these are things that we've surveyed in the AMS. A, a large part of our population thinks that hurricanes and typhoons are fundamentally different types of storms, when in fact they're just the same type of storm, just they're in a different geographic location. Chemtrails, I, I talked to my meteor, TV meteorology colleagues, they get at least 10% of their calls a day from the public are people saying that the government is spraying things out of airplanes, so the long tail uh, cloud that comes out of airplane are chemicals that government is using to control our minds. Chemtrails, Google it if you haven't heard of that. It, it's just basic physics. <laughs> you blow, what happens when you blow your breath on a cold day? You get a, you know, it's condensation. So we're all producing chemtrails, again, according to the con uh, conspiracy theory. Polar vortex, every time it got cold the last two years, it was the polar vortex, right? Well, the polar vortex is something that's always been there. Um, and, all, and so on and so on. So these are just things to keep in mind. I mean, I've, I've kind of hammered the point home. One more point, because you guys in Washington, D.C., I've lived here in the D.C. area, you guys are almost always on the rain-snow line during these nor'easters, right? There's, and it's a challenge, and so is Georgia. This was a, a, a snow event that we had back in February. This was the National Weather Service predicted forecast, four to six inches up here. I grew up here in this area. I currently live here. University of Georgia is here, just to give you a reference point. And this is what actually happened. Now, to a first order, it was a really good forecast from our perspective. But if you look closely, these people here, there was a bit more of an expectation of frozen, but they stayed in the rain, the rain snow line. If I had told any meteorologist that I can get the rain snow line to within 15 to 20 miles accurate, they'd be like, you're kidding me, a couple of years ago. But we do now. But to these people here that were expecting snow, this was a busted forecast. So again, it's a perception issue. And it's one that I know the DC area deals with often as well. So then let me get to the final challenges. Has anybody found sports? We talked about sports once already with LeBron. Still haven't said anything about cola or zombies yet, but I'm about to talk about zombies because zombie theories are a big problem in climate communication. This is something I call, well, what is a zombie theory? I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. First, let's look at this. Well, the, we can argue about this number, but this number really, 97% of people who are publishing on climate in the peer-reviewed literature and express opinion know that humans are contributing to the changing climate. But this is... The Six America study, a study from Yale University and George Mason, this shows the various levels of public concern. There are some that are doubtful. There are some that are even dismissive. Some are disengaged. So there is a large part of the population that is disconnected from what the science community thinks. And part of the reason, I believe, is because of these zombie theories. Well, what is a zombie theory? Well, zombie theory, these theories are hypotheses that live on in the blogs and on in op-eds and on Twitter, although the science has long killed them. But they live on like zombies. <laughs> You've heard them. I, he I heard one this morning on the radio. Well, what are some of the zombie theories? Well, here they are. Climate's changed before. It's the sun. It's not bad. There's no consensus. It's cooling. Models are unreliable. Temperature record is unreliable. It hasn't warmed since 1998. Antarctica is gaining. I mean, 
Go to this website, skepticalscience.com. I highly recommend it. It's one of the best websites out there refuting. They, these are scientists that have actually have refuted hundreds of zombie theories. I mean, I, just the other day, I mean, I'm, just, I'm hanging out at Subway trying to enjoy my sandwich. And we, as this guy it strikes up a conversation, and I'm okay with that. But he finds out I work in climate. So he's like, you know, Dr. Shepard, it's climate change is naturally. I get that one a lot. How many of you get that one, that deal in climate? I mean, I have three degrees in meteorology. I was, somehow I didn't miss that the climate changes naturally. But there is something on top of it. So, but much of this really propagates because of the zombie theories in the media. So most skeptics, for example, will focus on very short-term or long-term climate changes without looking at the rate of change. Scientists often talk about the rate of change. So some of the changes that we see now happening over the span of a couple of decades or years, perhaps in the past, took hundreds of years to happen. So think back to calculus class, the derivative, it's the rate of change which is of concern. Claire Parkinson's sitting in the room. She studies the cryosphere. I'm sure she's seeing some really odd things in the cryosphere in some of her work. Changing climate will also cause some areas to improve, uh, particularly in the short term or medium term, while others suffer more of the consequence. This is one we often hear too. Well, it's not bad. I mean, we'll be able to grow wine grapes in certain places, or we can come through the Northeast Passage with shipping. Well, I'm sure there was some good benefit of Hurricane Katrina too, but there were certainly more bad from Katrina's. And it, no, it's not about grant money. <laughs> That's one that I often hear too. Oh, you guys are in this for grant money. I, you know, I, we make decent living, but I don't know any really, really, really rich scientists. So we're not in this for the money. Trust me, I, I do understand that. So I have. So how do we overcome these challenges? Well, we've got. I believe these. These are sort of drifting into my thoughts now. We've got to frame weather climate issues in terms of business risk, security, and opportunity. So here's COLA. Because my colleague and friend, Jeff Seabright, Coca-Cola's Vice President for the Environment and Water Resources, look at what he said recently in the New York Times. Increased drought, more unpredictable variability, 100-year floods every two years. When we look at our essential ingredients, things like water, uh, fruit juice, citrus, um, sugar beets. These are things, if you read this article, he talks about. We see these events are threats to their bottom line. This is the, a key executive with Coca-Cola. If you look at what Pacific, uh, the head of the Pacific Command in U.S. military said, he said his biggest threat is not North Korea. It's climate change. Okay. So when we start hearing business leaders and military leaders, I think we'll start to see a different narrative emerge. And then there's opportunity. President George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary, Hank Policy, wrote an op-ed talking about the business case for why climate change is important and why conservatives need to get on board. So how do we communicate? I heard this from a colleague at um, U.S. Forest Service, and I stole it, just flat out lifted it. I got permission from him. He says, we need to think about communicating climate using the elf land concept. What is that? Just for Steve McNulty, by the way. Well, he started off, and I totally agree with this, and I've been guilty of it at times, but I've gotten better about it. He started off by saying, mistakes scientists make when we talk about complex topics to the public. We start off with the physics and the science basis. We show a chart after chart like this with trend lines and things like that. And we focus on impacts to polar bears, permafrost in Russia and glaciers in Greenland, which are important, but will not resonate to the Rotary Club. So I love Descartes. If you don't know Descartes, follow him on Twitter. Find out as much as you can about him. He's, he's at NOAA's NCDC, or what was NCDC. Deke said, for example, about the last 12 months. The last 12 months have completely obliterated the field. He's using a sports analogy. The last 12 months not only won the race in terms of warming, but it had time to change clothes before the others even got on the final lap. That's how much warmer the last 12 months have been compared to the previous 30 years. And that's Deke Art's eloquent way of putting it. So 
AAAS, I did a workshop for the AAAS at uh, Georgia recently. Scientists, we're trained, all, many of us in this room are trained to start off giving them all these background details, the lit review, um, the, all the background supporting details, and at the end of our talk, when people are drifting off a little bit, we give the results. But when we're communicating to broader audiences, we need to start with the bottom line. And then go the opposite. So the way we as scientists are trained is fundamentally flawed if we're trying to communicate to audiences beyond our field. There are study after study that show this. We also make this flaw. We throw around jargon. We throw around jargon. You'll hear a scientist say a positive trend. And we know that that's a trend that's going up. But to the public, positive sounds good. Right? That's, it's positive. Bias, we know what bias means in science, but to the public, bias has, connotes negative or distortion or devious intent. I heard a scientist just in this meeting that I was at today say, throw PDF, and this, there, this was a public forum at this particular, said, throw PDF around, probability density function or whatnot. But, I guarantee if I, my wife, who's at the visitor center right now with my kids, if I said, what is a PDF, she thinks it's a file format. <laughs> so we, we've got to watch the jargon, because we're guilty. So what is Elfland? Getting back to that. And Catherine Hayhoe, it, really, Elfland is really just this. You, you find the common value. I have walked into rooms to give talks on climate change where I know that 95% of that audience was a skeptic. But I didn't come with the trend lines and the rates. It was a group of, in this most recently, of foresters and farmers. And I said, we all know that what variability of weather affects your crops, right? Yes, they could agree to that. You see changes from time to time, yes. Here in Georgia, are we noticing that drought has been more intense and frequent over the last 30 years? They all agree with that, too. See, I didn't say anything that they disagree. I found a common value. Establish contact, list and found common ground. And when you do that, that lessens the mistrust. Because they think I'm some scientist that's trying to get grant money or um, you know, just a tool for the administration or something. But you find a common ground and then assess needs based on that. That's the whole concept of Elfland. But if you can't remember this, just when we're talking about these topics, find a common value. So for example, Someone said, why do I care that the drought in California is happening? Why do I care about that? I live in um, Decula, Georgia. I said, well, did you have a salad today? Because something that you probably ate in that salad was grown in California. Oh. <laughs> and so if you find that common ground, if you find that common ground, then op-eds like Jay Familietti, who is uh, JPL, you got Cal Irvine, Jay was being a little provocative with this LA Times title. California has about one year of water left. We'll rash it, will we rash? He was being a little provocative. Now, he was really talking about groundwater. But he got, he got the point across, though. Or just show them this, how fragile we are. By the way, I like Sting. So if you know Sting music, you know there's a song called How Fragile We Are. But I'm using it to say, look, that's the amount of water in, on, and above the earth. That amount there is the amount of liquid fresh water. And that tiny little dot there is the amount of fresh water. That's how much we have available to us, essentially. So when you show them things like this, it's just a different way to resonate. And then finally, we have to know the tactics that are out there. I highly recommend the book um, uh, by Na Naomi Oreskes, Merchants of Doubt, because she brought, breaks down how the same industry that the tobacco industry uses, used when the science came out and said that nicotine was addictive and smoking was harmful, they used the strategy to try to discredit the science. The same consultants and tactics are being used in the climate change discussion. And that book breaks it down. Consider your sources carefully. You'll often see op-eds written saying that there are 31,000 scientists that refute the basic premise of climate change. Yeah, but that scientist might be, um, I don't know, studying in another area, which is fine. We all have. A, thoughts and opinions on various topics. But I, I'm personally, I have a PhD, but I'm not going to weigh in on what kind of rod should be used in nuclear power plants to cool the, I, mean, I don't know anything about that. But I could write an op-ed on it. 
and sign my name, Dr. Marshall Shepard, and someone would give me credibility. But you, we've got to dig deeper than that. And at the end of the day, if that doesn't work, just remember what Upton Sinclair said that wrote The Jungle. He said that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And just let that marinate for a little bit when you think about who has the most gain or lose in this topic, some powerful, in, uh, powerful forces in certain industries. But at the end of the day, I blame OJ. I mean, I mean, <laughs> but I'm serious. I'm actually going somewhere with this. I'm actually going somewhere with this. I really am. I'm going somewhere with this, believe it or not. Because we all remember the OJ Simpson trial. If it didn't fit, must have quit. But what this really did, I believe, is it brought forth a public that's very familiar with the court system and court proceedings, the notion of reasonable doubt. People understand if, that, if there is some reasonable doubt in a court case, it can be dismissed because of that little degree of uncertainty. Science doesn't work that way. So look at what I said recently in an article. I said, I find now that in the era of armchair science, many people just don't understand the scientific process, the peer review process, et cetera. They see things more like a legal system and reasonable doubt. If there is a reasonable doubt or slight uncertainty, they think the basic scientific premise is flawed. We deal with some uncertainty all the time in science. That doesn't mean the data is unusable. For example, there is uncertainty in an 80% chance of rain, but most of you probably will grab an umbrella if there's an 80% chance of rain. I didn't say there was 100%. There is uncertainty, but there's a lot of usable information too. So there's uncertainty in many medical doctors' diagnoses, but we consume their information. So I, I mention this to say that the concept of reasonable doubt and the way we think about maybe business practices, science just doesn't work that way. And so with that, I'll close and kind of bring it full circle because I've just talked to you about some things that I'm passionate about. I gave you some background on how I kind of got from A to B in terms of my science career. But I always step back and reflect on what sort of guided me in my career as I went from a curious young kid catching honeybees in my yard, getting stung by one and almost dying to a point now where somebody somewhere considers me an expert on weather and climate. Now, that's, you can debate that. But um, I always had strong guidance and support at home. And I think that's probably a story that many of us can say, even from a single parent mother who knew the value of education, and even from my dad, who I didn't grow up around. I have a relationship with him now. I honestly tried to lead as much as I could not follow. And I'm trying to instill this in my kids to this very day. And it's tougher for them today than it was even for me, because there's so many more forces tugging at them in social media, Instagram, various places. But I just never cared what other people were doing or saying. I just kind of did my thing. And that kind of is the third point. But I always, and this is something that's important to me, it's not necessarily, I always remain well-rounded. I mean, I lettered in two sports in, in high school. I mean, I pledged fraternity in college. Heck, I worked at Hardee's. That ended real quick after they brought me in at 3 a.m. wanting me to make biscuits one morning. My mom didn't want to. <laughs> that was in high school. But I bought my first car with my Hardee's paycheck. And I always set goals. I set goals now. I do, and I check them off. I, whenever I talk to the audience's kids, I, I, one of the things I charge them to do is go home. And this works for adults, too. So where you wanna, what do you want to be? What are your goals in one year, five years, 20 years? Put that in your drawer and just you know, work from that list. And then reset and recalibrate your goals. And now whatever you do, have passion about it. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would doubt. Anyone that follows me, any of my friends, anyone that follows me in social media knows I'm passionate about weather and climate. And hopefully that conveys in everything that I do when you watch Weather Geeks or even when I give a talk like this. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. You're setting goals, Marshall, and also your testimony before Congress. Mm -hmm. I understood at one point you might want to be a congressman. Yes. Where do, where do we stand on that and where do I send the check? <laughs> 
Well, you know, the reality, Andy, is that was probably a bit more feasible given some of my leanings when I lived in Maryland. But if you know anything about Georgia, <laughs> probably not going to happen. <laughs> Although it is trending purple a little bit. But no, seriously, I mean, I, you know, anybody that does know me knows at one point I, you know, and it's interesting because I've always been engaged, even in school. I mean, at Florida State, I was uh, senior class president. At, in high school, I was always involved. So though I had an acumen for science and those types of things, I've always had an interest in, in engaging as well. And, and so, you know, who knows what the future holds? <laughs> Other comments? John, my buddy John Awusu here. Yeah, we, 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 by the way, these three guys right here, and Dan, where's Dan, and, and Luther, I saw him in here somewhere. Um, if you ever migrated into Building 21, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, and heard a group of loud black guys laughing and talking, it was, because we, seriously, we had a lot of, we were all, we're all good friends, but we always were engaging in topics that ranged the full spectrum as well. So I, these guys, I, we, we kept each other sharp. <laughs> So um, going back to your 40% chance of rain question, yes. do the people who choose to deliver forecasts on our local news, can they explain that? No. That's a good question. John asked, can, this is interesting because a colleague of mine, Dr. John Knox, actually has a study that's about to be published in the bulletin of the AMS where he, for a class project at the University of Georgia, they surveyed 200 professionals in meteorology. TV meteorologist, National Weather Service speaker, and the range of answers to that exact same question I asked was the same. So it illustrates that there, so what it illustrates to me is that there's a fundamental issue and problem how we are communicating many things, whether it's an advisory. And so to, to the credit of our, our colleague, Louis Uccellini and others, uh, we are seeing efforts now where the science community is engaging social scientists, psychologists, people skilled in communication. Because we know how to build a satellite. We know how to you know, program a model that gets better as we get faster computers. But we can give you all the information you want. Like, let's look at the Moore and El Reno tornadoes in, in Oklahoma a couple of years ago. Those forecasts are spot on. I don't even have to do that. Let's look at Superstorm Sandy that affected this region. We saw six to nine days out that this storm was going to make a hard left. That's unheard of from a modeling standpoint, but we had really good information, yet people still died because people will make and form their own, make their own decisions. So, for example, in the tornado cases in Moore and uh, El Reno, you had one meteorologist that was on the air saying, hunker down, find shelter near where you can. You had another meteorologist in the same market on another station telling people to get in their cars and drive south. We had the largest loss of life on the road from a tornado in history from that tornado because there was conflicting information. So what we're finding in meteorology, at least, is there's more to learn in the social sciences of our field more than maybe the bits and bytes of the computer models. So, yes. When you're, when you're in a forum that is heavily populated with climate skeptics, mm -hmm. how do you uh, tend to offset their concerns that you represent an acute challenge to their ideology and personal beliefs? Well, I alluded to a little bit. I just try to find the common value. And there's about 5% of that audience that you're just not going to reach. And so as soon as you identify who they are, you just don't waste your energy on that, that small segment. But the ones that are sort of have, and you know, one thing I try to get across, even in, and I want to make sure I say it here too, science is about asking questions. So. Um, it, it, it is not about accepting one position and saying that's it, it's an undeal. But one of the things I will say to the skeptic community like that is that, you know, there are skeptics that are publishing the peer review literature. That's our value system in science. You know, for example, you know, I, I'm on Facebook and I get someone to, every now and then will say, hey, why don't you try this new vitamin energy drink that I'm using? I was like, is it FDA approved? No? Well, I'm not trying it. That's just me. But I'm not going to deal with that. Peer review literature is our FDA approval for a, new, for a new idea. And so people don't understand that process. So I try to convey that. But the main thing you can do is just trying to find a core value system you can, as the Elfland concept. Try to establish that I represent no entity, no sort of nothing to gain. Like I said, and I, th I thought I had it up. Um, one of the things I'll often end the talk with that group is saying, I hope you are right. 
as I said earlier, I hope you are right for my kids' sake. I don't want them to have to live in a world 20 years from now where dengue is a possibility. And I'm not saying dengue has a correlation right now to climate. There are some that suggest that it might. But as we see warming inch its way further north, it's not by accident that doctors in Canada are having to now come to the U.S. to learn how to treat Lyme disease. They didn't know how to treat it, but now it exists because the vector that carried it can live in Canada now. All right. It's not by accident. I, Senator Udall asked me in that Senate briefing, he said, how do I convey this to my constituents? He's a senator. And that was 2012. And I said, Cheerios. That was my answer to him. And everyone was like, what? What are you talking about? I said, your constituents this year are paying more for Cheerios because this drought in the Midwest has suppressed the wheat and corn crop. So when you can try to, so the problem is, and this is, I alluded to this earlier, too many people still feel like climate change is something off in the distance when it's actually, we see its fingerprints and DNA right now, and it, people are feeling it in ways that they might not be aware of until you make them aware of it in some regard. So I find that is one thing that helps as well. Yeah. I'd like you to comment on your piece that you did on, on the post on the current budget cuts oh, yeah, and potential. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a particular part that's very concerning that you alluded to. Uh, and it's Are you talking about piece of Washington Post? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's what I get, we're kind of projecting out is that a lot of the core missions for weather and climate are being descoped to the point that we're looking at potentially having polar orbiters with just two sounders, and that's it because we can't afford anything else. Yes. How do we get past that to the point that we understand the priorities of having sounders for the five-day forecast, but to have a package that also has climate prediction is key. And, but that's, it costs money to have those instruments too. Yeah, no, it's, well, what you just have to do, and I tried to do that in that piece, I just said that six, nine days out, we knew that Sandy was gonna make a hard left. The model showed that, the ECMWF model, even the GFS picked it up. By the Europeans' own studies, that forecast would have been wrong had the satellite data not been assimilated into the model. Policymakers need to understand that. They, because one of the things I have found, I've, I've briefed, I briefed, I was just on an email yesterday with a staffer. They're planning a hearing in September, and they were asking me for names of people that would be good that can talk about uh, the, the cuts to geosciences and earth sciences to the business community. And one of the things that I was you know, telling them is that they love weather. Look, let's just give this, the, the, the current Congress for all of their sort of political leanings either way, they love weather. So for me, I can put on my weather hat when I need to, but when we talk about with this with them, you have to make the point that many of the advances that we have in weather prediction that our aviation industry uses, that that farmer back in your home state uses, is benefiting from satellite data that's being assimilated into the model. It's not by accident that that cone is shrinking that I showed you with Katrina or that we knew that left turn was coming. It's because this new generation of data coming from satellite, because we still, at the end of the day, only launch weather balloons twice a day. But our atmosphere doesn't function every 12 hours. It functions continuously. It's a dynamic fluid. So we need to sample it as often as we can. And that's, so we, can, we have to make that kind of, you have to bring that esoteric argument back to something they understand, which is dollars and national security. That's what I believe. Those are the things that I try to, and so that's, if you looked at that Washington Post piece, those are the two things that I've, I served on a National Academies panel recently, looking at climate change impacts on the Navy. And the, when you go into those staffer rooms with these congressmen and senators, they will tell you behind closed doors, a lot of this, they get it. They honestly get it. But it's not, it's the politics of getting reelected and constituencies is more complex than that. I understand that, but that's the reality. I've been told that behind closed doors. So these people are smarter than we think they are. Yeah. yeah. The uh, weather predictability is improving. Uh, how much of that is due to the satellites like the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission? Oh, it's all due to trim and GPM. <laughs> of course, I worked on it. I'm biased. But no, yeah, I, well, and that's, that's a good question. And actually, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, the ECMWF, they run the Euro model. If you follow our circles, there's even a debate going on about whether the Euro model is better than the US model. 
And the reality is they do something a little bit different than our models. They, they, they're basically, just to give you a quick weather 101, we make our weather forecast, we put data into a weather model, it solves the Navier-Stokes and other equations and predicts how this fluid changes three days from now or five days from now. And the more you can update that information, the better the forecast is. Well, Europeans do it with something called four-dimensional data assimilation. So they're taking data, they're taking satellite information, they're running the model, and then they're nudging it with new information as it comes from the satellite. Right now, we use something called 3D data assimilation. It's not because we don't know how to do it in the US, it's being done right here at Goddard. But operationally, it's now starting to be done because we didn't have, strong, we didn't have the computer horsepower the Europeans had. Well, you say, wait a minute, we're the US of A. Why don't we have the computing? Well, it's a different model because here in the United States, we have to, when Congress gives NOAA its budget, they have to not only buy computers for the models, they have to buy satellites, they have to staff weather forecast offices, they have to put in new Doppler radar. Europeans can spend their money on satellites. I mean, I'm sorry, on computers for their models because they use our satellites and a lot of other people's as well. But they use a lot of the information going into the model. That's real. I wasn't, that wasn't taking a shot. That's real. They use a lot of our trim data, GPM data. That's all being assimilated in. And they've done the studies. The forecasts take a significant hit when you pull out all of the satellite data and just initialize the model with, say, weather balloon data or ground-based data. So we know the impact is there. I think we've got to do a better job of telling the story. So thank you so much. Okay,